We got here books as Sephardic and Misrahi Jewry from the Golden Age of Spain to Modern Times, by edited by Sion Sohar. It says here the origins of Sephardic Jewry in the medieval Arab world. Mark R. Cohen it says world Jewry can be divided into two parts: the Jews of Islam and the Jews of Christendom, or I have, as I have referred to them, as Jews living under the crescent and Jews living under the cross. All right, the Jews under the crescent comprise those who form their traditions in the Islamic world, encompass populations stretching from Persia, all right, from Persia, Islamic world from Persia, right? Where's Persia? We just came from that area, ancient area. We're talking about Sardis, Sparta, all that, right? In the east to North Africa and Muslim Spain in the west, all the way. That's all right there. You heard that? All the way to Spain. The Jews under the cross are those of the Christian Roman Empire and the predominantly Greek Byzantium who survived in the Eastern Mediterranean into the Middle Ages. This group also includes the Jews of Latin Europe, England, France, Germany, and Italy, and from the 13th century on the Kingdom of Poland and its affiliate states in Eastern Europe. All right, all these converts. Collectively, the Jews of Northern and Eastern Europe are referred to Ashkenazic Jewry. All right. The Ashkenazims are commonly contrasted with the Sephardim, the Jews of Spain of Spanish descent. However, a problem exists as to whether or not Sephardic Jews comprise a third group of Jewry distinct from the two groups I mentioned at the outset. The difficulty stems from the fact that the Sephardim are historically part of the Jews of Christendom since they descend from those expelled from Catholic Spain in 1492, while the term Sephardim has also been employed in recent times to designate those Jews in Israel who emigrated from Muslim Arab lands, all right? Originally, Sepharad was a place mentioned in the Bible in the book of the prophet Obadiah, we know that, right? Which is only one chapter long. Israel's enemy, Edom, the Edomites or Edomians, is threatened with destruction. An oracle indicates there will come the day of the Lord when all Israel's enemies will be defeated and the entire Israelite dispersion will return to Zion, among other diaspora communities. The oracle prophecies that the Jerusalemite exile community of Sepharad shall possess the towns of Negev. Here, in other words, Sepharad was a place in ancient Jewish diaspora. It was thought to be Sardis in Asia Minor, right? We just read that. It was thought to be Sardis in Asia Minor. Well, what happened? The Aramaic translator of the Bible rendered Sepharad by the word Aspamia, presumably thinking of Apamia city in Mesopotamia. But the word sounded similar to Hispania, an ancient name for the Iberian Peninsula. 
The Jews who lived in Muslim Spain in the Middle Ages believed they were descendants of the Jewish nobility of Jerusalem who were captured by the Romans and later deported to Rome and Spain. After the destruction of Jerusalem in the first century CE, these medieval Spanish Jews concluded that Sepharad in the oracle of the prophet Obadiah meant Spain and therefore they called themselves Sephardim. All right, now a little further down, I want to get into the what, why I came to this book. It says Sephardic civilization began long before the Reconquista, in a time when the peninsula was ruled by Muslims and when Arabic culture surrounded and influenced the Jews. What? Arabic culture influenced the Jews. Sephardic society in the medieval Arab world was characterized by several features. Its sense of noble descent, its tradition of service to Gentile rulers, its tradition of service to Gentile rulers. Why were they doing that? Its high cultural achievement in philosophy and poetry and its history of crypto Judaism, secret Judaism. The secret continued practice of Judaism after apparent conversions under duress. If you don't understand what they're saying is a lot of these Sephardic Jews and even Muslim Moors, uh, they had to secretly, you know, practice their religion, but they had to openly admit to be Christians. So they were labeled Christians, but they weren't. They were crypto Jews or Moriscos crypto uh, Muslims. Conventional wisdom has traditionally held that medieval Jews living in the Arab world enjoyed substantially greater security and higher level of political and cultural integration than Jews living under the cross did, all right? So, you know, even if modern times you got Muslims fighting Jews and, you know, that's what we see in the news all the time. During this time, Sephardic Jews were living good under Muslim rule, under Arab rule. Down here it says, many Jews discovered that the only road to true equality was through conversion to Christianity. Others tried through religious reform to gain approval by writing uh, Judaism of the medieval attributes that Christians loathe. All right, I'm in this book. Uh, real quick, the correlate says, Farewell, España, the world of the Sephardim remembered by Howard M. Sakar, Sephardim. Again, farewell, España, the world of Sephardim. Remember, right? Sephardi, Sephard. All right, so it's talking about the uh, Andalusia and Cordoba city after the conquest of the Moors. And it says here that it was a city, a realm that proved uniquely co congenial to its Jews, dispersing small enclaves throughout the southern and central regions of the peninsula. These Jews of Sepharad, the Hebrew term for Iberia, openly welcomed their new conquerors. What? They openly what? They openly welcomed their conquerors, the Moors. They helped them. Yet earlier under the Christian Visigoths, the Sephardim, remember who the Visigoths, the Goths, the Sumerians, the Goths, the same people of the Japhetic tribes, the Sephardim had endured harsh conver conversionary pressures and intermittent physical ab abuse. Now they were quite prepared to offer their services to the invaded Moors. Who's offering their services? Sephardic Jews, even to organize their own Jewish militias for battle against a common enemy. It was useful commitment from the 8th century onward ruled by the far-sighted Abd al-Rahman and his heirs. The Umayyad Caliphate was preoccupied far less with religious orthodoxy than with economic prosperity. To be sure, the Jewish and Christian populations were to be regarded as dehimis under Islamic law, that is, as non-heathen, but still essentially second-class citizens. They're not heathens, but they're second-class citizens. As such, they were subjected to criminatory poll taxes, to residential and vocational restrictions, to social discrimination, even to demeaning badges of personal identification. In consequence, the royal administration have learned to trust the Jews, even as consigned them to their own residential quarters in Cordoba, Seville and other captured cities. It ensures that they were decently accommodated as a rule within sighted under the protection of the royal palace, right? These Jews were being protected by the Moors, all right, and suffered no limitations on their freedom of movement or economic activity. 
the arrangement was productive enough to attract Jews from other lands. During the 8th and 9th centuries, several thousand Moroccan and Egyptian Jews joined the far larger numbers of Muslim Berbers who migrated to Andalusia. Few were disappointed, in contrast to their circumstances in Christian Europe, where they were limited essentially to mercantile activities, mercantile merchants, mercantile Jews in Spain were allowed a far more diversified socioeconomic base. Some acquired modest plots of land and cultivated orchards and vineyards. Many others became leather workers, tanners, dyers, jewelers, and silversmiths. To this day, former Jewish neighborhoods in Cordoba, Seville, Zaragoza, Malaga, and other southern Spanish cities bear such names as Plaza of the Tanners, Street of the Dyers, Lane of the Shoemakers, of al Seria de los Judíos, Silk Market of the Jews. Above all, the Sephardim were heavyweight merchants. Who? The Sephardim, the Sephardians, who was merchants as well, the Sumerians, right? We're going to learn about the Rada Knights, Rada Knights, all right? What do they have to do? Why they are so involved in merchant and trade, right? Remember the Sumerians and these people were also, what was their relation with Danites as well, or Israelite or groups or Hebrew groups, right? These uh, Sumerians. We're going to dig into all this, right? We're going to keep digging. Again, above all, the Sephardim, the Sephardians, Sephardims were heavyweight merchants as the diadem of Caliphate that linked the southern Mediterranean world in a network of standard standardized laws, weights, measures, and currency exchange. Andalusia offered Jews an arena for commerce unparalleled since the glory days of Rome. They set up shop for them to work. They were like, all right, y'all good at this? We got it. We're going to do commerce here. It was unparalleled since the day, glory days of Rome. Sailing the Great Middle Sea, Jewish traders shared amply in the widening traffic. Remember that the Danites were known as the Sea People too. All right. In Andalusia itself, they were the premier importers, exporters of silk, leather, textiles, grain, fruit, spices, and cattle, including the human cattle of slaves, including the what? The human cattle. Who? Who? Sephardi Jews, Sephardim Jews. They were the importers and exporters of slaves from the Balkans and Western Russia, Slavs and Rus people, the Slavs and Rus people. Moreover, Islamic rule in Spain offered the Jews still another boon, one no less precious than physical and economic security. This was communal self-government. Though a, through a council of their own notables, Jews assessed the tax themselves. Their funds were applied both to the governments and collective dehimi, poll taxes, and to the Jews' own social health and educational services. All right, so it goes on and on. I mean, this book says Handbook to Life in the Medieval World, uh, Volume 3, by Madeline Pelner Cosman, Linda Gale Jones. It says here in this part, Sephardim, the Jews of Al Andalus. It says the Jews who aided the Muslim armies in establishing Islamic rule in the Iberian Peninsula, they aided. Again, they helped them, right? Because they had the, the routes, they had the trade routes. They knew how to help them get in. They controlled the money, they controlled the economy. The Jews who aided the Muslims armies in establishing Islamic rule in the Iberian Peninsula were rewarded with one of the most lenient and generous manifestations of the Himi status. Remember second class. Jews engaged in all manners of occupations from agricultural and tea culture to commerce, trade, medicine, and the crafts. Jews exercised complete authority over their internal affairs and were governed by the Jewish exilarch called Ha Nazi, the prince in Andalus. All right. I got this in my video, Columbus and his Negro friends. If you haven't seen that, go back. All right. How I explain how they use that word. It meant prince of Andalus and Jewish exilarchs were titled Ha Nazi, Nazi, a Nazi. I thought that was supposed to be against Jews, but they were actually, as it says here, let me just show you, the most famous Jewish prince in Muslim uh, Spain was powerful Samuel Ibn Nagrela, also known as Samuel Ha Nagrid or Ha Nazi, the prince. Born at Cordoba in 1993, during his long and tumultuous life, he witnessed the fall of the Umayyad Caliphate in 1031, and himself victim of the political intrigues of the court. All right, again, what do they say? A famous Jewish prince in Muslim Spain. All right, 
they weren't always at war. These people had a confederation, a coalition, a union. Just oh, correct. Right? This is the Cambridge Guide to Jewish History, Religion, and Culture by, edited by Judith R. Baskin and Kenneth uh, Siskin. The political, ethnic, and social fragmentation of Andalusian society, remember this is in Spain, provided Jews an unparalleled opportunity for government service. A significant class of Jewish courtiers arose who emulated the model of Hasda'i. They included such high-ranking administrators as Jekutiel Ibn Hassan in Zaragoza, who was the patron of the young poet and philosopher Solomon Ibn Gabiro and Abraham Ibn Muhajid in Seville, who bore the titles of vizier at court and Nazi, Nazi, all right, Nazi in the Jewish community, a Nazi in the what, a Nazi in the what, in the Jewish community. He was praised by leading poets of the period, such as Judah HaLevi and Moses Ibn Ezra, and the latter dedicated his collection of poems, the Book of the Necklace, all right, so I hope you understand, and it can keep going, they actually were living good in these times, especially if they're in commerce and helping them, you know, get control of this part of the world, Iberia. So I want to read uh, this book now. It says, The Non-Jewish Origins of the Sephardic Jews. Hey, I didn't say it. Paul Wexler, on page 25 of this book, it says here, The Sephardic Jewish population had the same constellation of geographical origins as the Arabs and Berbers. Same. Historical, ethnographic, and onomastic evidence shows that, all right? Historical, ethnographic, and onomastic evidence shows that. In addition to a North African component in the Iberian Jewish community, Jews from Syria, listen, Jews from Syria, Iraq, and the Arabian Peninsula also accompanied the Arabs to North Africa and Spain on the westward march of Jews and Bedouins, all right? There seems to have been one significant difference in the Jewish and non-Jewish migrations. Whereas Muslim migrations from North Africa to Spain continued through the 12th and 13th century, with varying intensities, the Jews seem to have participated primarily in only an early wave of migration to Spain between 8th and 10th centuries. It says here, continuing in the absence of significant linguistic data, I have to rely on historical documentation to establish that there were contacts between Iraqi Jewish scholars and their con counterparts in North Africa and Spain between the 8th and 10th centuries. Iraqi Jews settled in Spain and North Africa, while Spanish Jews enrolled in Jewish ac academies in Iraq, continuing in Silmach, Morocco and Iraq, see Asher 1972 and Toby 1982, on the settlement of Iraqi Jews in Cairo in the 9th century. A particularly intriguing early instance of East-West networking among far-flung Jewish communities is the correspondence between the Turkic Khazar King Joseph. All right, here we go, Khazars, right? What we learned earlier about the Khazars, the celebrated 10th century Arab Jewish, Arab Jewish, Arab Jewish diplomat Hasdaim Saprud, who was born in Jaen on a possible Khazar migration to Spain, on a possible Khazars. The Khazars made it to Spain, right? The Khazars, Ashkenaz people. So as Iraqi and Gem Gemini Jews might have transmitted some terms to Spain in addition to Talmud in the Hebrew Judeo-Arabic Bible, the Talmud. Note that he, Mikav, commandment, has assumed the secondary meaning of funeral or coffin, only Judeo-Spanish and Iraqi Judeo-Arabic. All right, so these Judeo-Spanish, and we already see a lot of links to Iraq, Persians, and, and Turkish, and so there is a lot of link to going back uh, with these people. It says the appearance of Art al-Minsar, the pulpit in the mosque in Judeo-French of the 11th century, and in all dialects of Yiddish, in stark contrast to its absence in Sephardic sources, also raises the possibility of an Iraqi source for this Arabism. After Iraqi Jews migrated to Northern Europe, note previously discussion in this chapter, and look into the East for models of scholarship and religion, the Jews followed Andalusian Muslim practice. Andalusian what? Muslim practice. Only after a thousand did the cultural and religious institutions of the Iberian Jews and Muslims become independent of foreign models and institutions. Tino says here, the role of Western Asian converts in the formation of the Sephardic Jews. Western Asian, Western Asian converts, 
converts, the acts of widespread conversion to Judaism that might have influenced the formation of the Iberian Jewish communities must be sought in the peninsula and in North Africa, Arabia, Arab and Himorite territories both and in Iraq before and after the institutionalization of Christianity. And uh, guess what? So they admitted they basically took out pages 28 and 29 from this preview so we can know, but they were about to get into the drop here. Uh, you can see there was many converts as well. So I just wanted you to see the whole. When we're saying, when they're saying Sephardic, there's a whole history behind that. And so when you're saying that the Jews sponsored, you know, the whole slavery thing and the ships, then what are you talking about? Like who, what type of Jews? Because the main ones were Sephardic Jews. Because a lot of these ones being called Sephardic are not even Jewish. Right? Even though some might be, some might not be. A lot of sub ethnic groups remember a lot of conversion and different things happening here and we see that a lot of years they lived together in harmony not in harmony as second class citizens to them but living good controlling the commerce and having their own little government with the uh, moors with the uh, moors